Hi, Mark. It's Marco. I just want to let you know I'm trying to get my video going here, but I'm having a little bit of an issue with Zoom today. Well, as the technologist on the call, you should have a better chance than me. That's right. <laughs> um, We're good to go. Are we good to go? Yeah. Great. Uh, welcome, everyone, uh, to the Thursday, October 8th EDIC RDA meeting. Um, according to the Governor's Executive Order 7B, this meeting is recorded. Uh, and will be available on the town's website within seven business days. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, good to see you. Um, we have a, a fairly robust meeting this morning, uh, or I should say this afternoon. Uh, so, Pete, we'll get uh, we'll get started. Uh, I don't think we have anything to vote on unless we need to vote on any modifications to the outreach letter. Um, I don't know if that was required by quorum, if we need to make any changes to that or not. Is that something we would need a quorum for? <clears throat> um, no, I don't. I don't think so. We voted on this before we agreed to spend the money, so I think we're good. Uh, I agree. Okay, good. Um, let's get right into development project updates, Pete. Okay, uh, 170 Ridge Road Apartments is um, wrapping up, getting ready to have a CO issued. Um, that should be happening in the next uh, week or two. We gave them a list of things to do, so uh, good to see that project um, wrapping up. Uh, Maybe at some point uh, down the road, we can schedule a tour or something like that if anyone's interested in seeing the final uh, final product. Um, let's see. Um, I, I'm trying to, I, I may have lost track of our last meeting, but uh, nevertheless, we uh, are approached by the owner of 1000 Silas Dean Highway um, with an interested, um, an interested uh, party to buy it. Uh, something completely different than what's been talked about before. It's a uh, garlic company. They import garlic from South America. They would use the building as a food processing, similar to what it was historically. They would start out with about 40 employees. And as they expanded, they would be talking about maybe as many as 120 employees. So they're in a uh, conversation with the owner right now about the uh, the ability to do that. So uh, we will um, keep everyone posted on that. I received a uh, message this morning from the owner of 341 Jordan Lane. I got a 330 phone call with him. I had sent a couple of developers his way. This might be a follow up to that. Um, uh, at Tuesday night's Planning and Zoning Commission. We had a pre-application from a development group interested in buying the building and converting it into mixed use, apartments and commercial. Um, those are probably the, the main highlights of, um, you know, over the last couple of weeks that have been going on in terms of some of our vacant properties. <coughs> Peter, can I ask a question about the Masonic building? Sure. Um, it seems like for this pre-application meeting um, that the property owner was really interested in getting some guidance as to what folks would like to see there, um, knowing that she really can't make it all uh, residential, correct, unless she gets uh, some sort of zoning board of, app of appeals uh, waiver. Um, correct. And, yep. and, yeah, and overall, I mean, I, you know, I watched the discussion and it, I don't know whether or not P and Z weren't that interested in offering that guidance or weren't prepared to offer the guidance. But it, you know, I just wasn't impressed by the exchanges that were taking place. And I wonder if there's any ability for a property owner like that in a critical location to seek more input, either from us, or either from EDIC. It's hosting an EDIC meeting. Or, um, um, okay. or from a, um, maybe the Heritage Commission in terms of what people might like to see in that building. And so I just wanted to get your feedback as to if there are there any other avenues before they go forward, if uh, if they'd like to hear um, maybe some more suggestions as to uh, as to what that 
property could be. Yeah, I, I think it, all of those um, other possibilities for input are available. We've had folks come to EDIC under pre-application in the past. However, at the end of the day, it's ultimately the Planning and Zoning Commission's decision in terms of the regulations and how they would apply and things like that. So I think um, giving them some additional input from you guys or others would be great. But at the end of the day, you know, it's, it's PNZ's uh, call. I can't really speak to, you know, their enthusiasm or lack thereof of guidance, but I've been talking, uh, to, they just, I think they were asking the multifamily question to see um, whether there was either strong opposition or strong support. And I clearly there was, there was ni neither. It was kind of a middle of the road feeling about it. So um, I think they got what they, after I talked to them the following morning they got what they needed out of it and um, are going to now crank. Uh, ultimately, it's going to come down to the numbers for these guys um, and how, how the numbers work out. Uh, I did I did give them you know, our facade program information, our tax incentive program information, the CPACE program information, and I also turned them on to the state historic preservation people about historic tax credits. So some of that stuff may help to uh, soften the financial blow of uh, the costs for that project. So um, they haven't even run the cost yet. So um, it's very, very, very preliminary. Without ever having been in that building, can you, do you, can you tell me what the basement looks like? Because I know there was a lot of discussion about the basement in terms of what the clearance is down there and, and, and how that could be converted. Yeah, the clearance is a little bit lower than the code, but there are ways of, of getting around the code. The entire building is completely gutted except for um, you know, the floor on the main floor, and then there's a floor on the second floor that isn't a complete floor. So. Um, it's basically a box with brick walls and, you know, the flooring that I mentioned, everything's been ripped out, all the wiring, everything, plumbing, completely, everything's been completely stripped. So they have a vanilla box to work with. Tom, do you have um, any um, thoughts or, or any guidance on it? Has anybody reached out to you? I like your questions, they're probing. Um, no, no, it's just that, that, you know, there was some discussion with some of the commission members uh, at P&Z about maybe wanting to, you know, make it more of, you know, have a little bit more of a community uh, interaction with, within the building itself. And they were, somebody suggested maybe making it like a, and I think there was interest in the property owner of maybe using that basement as a commercial space. And, and there wasn't a whole lot of vision, I think, offered by some members of the commission as to how you could actually make that work. But, um, but I think there, there, there was, I mean, I get a sense that people would like it to be a little bit more of a, of a little, have a little bit more interaction, community interaction within the building itself, rather than just a residential building. And so if there were some thoughts as to how to make that happen, whether how to convert, you know, the bottom floor in the commercial space. I mean, I've always thought that that could be some sort of an arts or a craft space. I don't know if, you know, it's hard to, it's hard to generate revenue. I know off of something like that, but, but in terms of being such a critical building on main street, um, I, you know, I, I, it would be nice if, if, if there was at least part of that building that, that could be used for, not even necessarily office space, but just to make it a little bit more connected to the rest of the businesses uh, on Main Street. Yeah, I, um, I, I share what you're. I share what you're thinking. I think the the biggest challenge on that space is um, the owner of the property. Um, uh, I think, from a musical chairs perspective, the music stopped once he purchased it from a what the from what the building is and worth and what somebody could actually do with it. I, the owner initially was going to make it an owner uh, and operated and lived in building for, uh, for he and his family, which you could make it work. I think the idea is at this point what he paid for it um, and what he can do with it are really at odds. A lot of like the other kind of white elephant properties that we're trying to get our hands around in town, 
you know, um, Metaplex and, and Weight Watchers and Masonic. So it's an economic piece. Um, I think, you know, uh, anything we can do to aid the, the owner, but at this point from an economics perspective, I think we're, we're kind of hamstrung on, on what the owner can do based on what the last purchase price was, which has basically doubled in the last 10 years, I think 15 years from what it was 15 years ago and what it is now uh, and what people pay for. I don't know what the value of the building is, um, but what people pay for it. Um, but it's certainly something to watch on. I, I mean, you, you know, if there's a way that the town can get involved and there's a pot of money somewhere that we can use to develop that space um, uh, with either state or federal funding of some sort, historic or whatnot, these are rocks I think as a group uh, we could turn over and you, you are a, a rock turner extraordinaire. So I would, I would share with you that if, if you want to work with anybody and, you know, the whole issue is making it work economically, financially. So if there's money available, we could try to make it work. But that building is, a, it's a purgat, you know, I throw that in the purgatory category. Um, you know, it's neither heaven or hell, but it's, uh, there's not a lot that we can do in, until it makes economic sense for the current owner. So, hey, uh, quick, uh, I, think we're giving, I think we're giving Tom's idea, though, or, or Tom's feedback, a little bit of, of short shrift. Um, I talked to a potential partner about that building personally. They looked at it, and the minute they heard, like, Historic District Commission, they were like, no way, see ya. They, the minute they heard that there was a Historic District Commission involved, they were like, no way, see you later. And then they saw the pricing on it and they balked. But I think Tom raises a good point. A, a property like that needs help being packaged, I think, in conjunction with the, with the realtor. I'm, I'm not coming up with the best idea here, but we just went down a whole list of different funding mechanisms and things like that. I think, I think there needs to be more put around that to help a potential buyer um, check their vision against what's an opportunity for them and make it easy. And I think having informal input, and I totally get why the PNC might be a little bit reticent or concerned about wanting to give quote informal advice that could lead down some tricky places. But I think if, if we took that as a redevelopment opportunity and really packaged information about it and made it easier for a buyer to understand, I think that there, there might be more interest. Well, I, I, I'm going to push back on that just a little bit. Um, the historic district, when they say the historic district, that's up to us to provide guidance and say they're not as scary as you think. Or, you know, the PNZ and the EDIC and the RDA are there to help support uh, and, and move things forward. It, but that's a piece that we can control. On the economic side, if they're balk at the price, again, there's nothing to do unless the owner of the property uh, can participate Willingly, we have to start there. The owner has to be flexible. The owner has to have some imagination, et cetera. There's only so much we can do. We could lead the horse to water, um, but we can't make it drink. So, yeah. the, Mark, I'll tell you, you didn't you didn't push back. You actually you, you're actually amplifying what I was saying exactly. That that's okay. that's what I think it should be. Is the, um, we should be helping that buyer have the understanding that P and Z and Historic District Commission aren't aren't scary places. Who's the contact? Here's information about what they look for. All of that stuff prepackaged, and 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 make the make the um, make the initial look less scary. All, all the better. I I think that'd be great for this property. So okay. so then I'll ask the somewhat rhetorical question, but I'll I'll take the feedback. So how do we do that? How do we let every buyer's agent know? That's, well, what I'm wish, here to, I, that's what I'm here to do, and that's what I've done in this case. So I, I don't want to beat this yeah, conversation was, to death, but I did meet with them several times before they even went to PNZ. They know about the commission. They've gone through the files. They know about various incentive programs. So I don't know that the commission needs to necessarily play a role in that up and until the time they come in to talk about a tax incentive or to talk about a facade improvement program. So you guys, uh, just so you know, that's... That's my job and that's what I do um, to make sure we talk them off the ledge if they have concerns about the Historic District Commission or they have concerns about parking. Um, so um, just, just so you know. Um, and to, to, to echo, I don't wanna sound like an echo chamber, but I mean, if, if I know at one point we uh, were asked to meet with Annie Dillon who was the realtor for the property when she was with Ravis and we said, yes, we would like to meet 
and then Annie switched to another um, uh, to a different real estate house. She's with someone else, and I can't can't recall. Um, but we are wide open and ready uh, to talk. You know, the realtor is the conduit between the buyer and the seller, and we would love to talk with Annie and or the owner. Um, and we have had conversations. We've had Mr. Tabche in our office a little over a year and ago, year and a half ago, talking about ideas and concepts that they could do for that building. Um, so we've been proactive, um, but uh, there's only so much we can do. I'm not looking to dodge. You guys know me. I'm looking for things to do. So um, if you think, Paul and or Tom, uh, that we should be putting together a, a tighter package, we can talk about that. Um, but I guess I really we should be talking with the realtor would be my suggestion to see um, if she's comfortable. But my guess is we've already traced those steps. And I know Pete's been pretty aggressive on dealing with anybody who's had any level of interest in that property. Any other discussion then on that building? Thank you for that discussion. Any other questions on that? Peter, any other updates? Uh, those were the main things I wanted to um, pass on to you. I'd be happy to answer any other questions about properties I didn't mention. Commission, any other questions on any other properties that we've asked Pete to really just give the highlights on things. Judy? Uh, what's going on with the Nochi's Kitchen? Um, are they, they, there's a sign up that they were closed and I, but I did see advertising for staff. Yeah, they're, they're open. They, uh, they're closed open. for a few days. They had, uh, quite frankly, they were, uh, wildly successful, got a little bit overwhelmed. Their, um, their, um, cash, uh, re register system. Uh, wasn't functioning properly, creating backups and customer complaints because of timing. So they closed down to get that all fixed, uh, grabbed some new employees. They opened again on Saturday. Uh, Good. Great, great chicken parm cutlet sandwich, in case you want to go in there. Um, right. So they're very, uh, very happy, and I think they're, uh, they've worked out the kinks. So they were just a little overwhelmed at the beginning. Good. Good. There would be overwhelmed and underwhelmed. That's actually great news. Work out the kinks. Anything else on property? All right, Pete. Uh, guys, we have a um, we have pages one through four on the um, more the memo that went out on September twenty fourth. It should have been in your packet uh, regarding the moratorium. Uh, Pete, you want to guide us through that? Sure. Very. Uh very quickly. Um, it ended up being a little bit longer in um, more text than I had uh, hoped, but in order to, I think, get um, some of the issues uh, in the regulations, it ended up having to be that way. I'm, I'm, hope, I'm, I'm open to any possible changes and suggestions. This is scheduled for hearing on um, November 4th, the day after election day with the Planning and Zoning Commission. So if anyone wants to uh, uh, tune in, Mark, I would certainly uh, ask that you, uh, if possible, put that on your agenda so you can uh, attend that meeting and uh, present the EDICs, uh, uh, you know, answer any of those questions. Um, so we're at the point now, this is the draft that will be subject uh, to the hearing on that date. So pages two, three, uh, and four are the, the actual contents of the language that we've uh, presented to the commission. In addition to this, I'm going to prepare a PowerPoint presentation uh, and share with them uh, all the work that's gone into this, share with them some of the photos that were taken of the other facilities and other communities, just so they understand specifically what we uh, have in mind uh, for this uh, new regulation. Um, after this meeting and after I get your input, I will share this with uh, uh, AJ Funaro, the owner of 1000 Silas Dean Highway. We did promise that we would give him the uh, proposal in advance of the hearing. So um, I won't go through um, all of the minutia because we've got other things on the agenda, but I did send it out in the packet and I would be happy to either answer questions or um, 
hear your specific uh, comments and, and concerns with this um, proposed language. Peter, assuming that maybe not everyone has read through this um, sure. as vigilantly as we are, do yep. we want to give a date um, where the um, commission can get back to you if they have any questions? Um, we want to get this really, I, I would say no more than it's been 24 hours if you have time to go through it with any questions. Would that be okay? Does the commission feel that would be appropriate? Oh yeah, that's fine. Uh, okay. With not hearing anything, why don't we guys give you, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very important document, one that we've been working on for a while. Um, we did discuss a majority of this pretty um, uh, succinctly and deeply, but I think the devil is always in the last minute of details. So I would say if you have any questions or concerns to uh, email Peter and I uh, by 12.30 tomorrow afternoon. Peter, would that be acceptable? Yeah, that's, that's fine, perfectly. Even if, even if it's um, you know, early next week, that's still, uh would would work um just to give you the the highlights um we we maintain that these proposals in the future have to have to be multi-story buildings uh with three or more stories uh they have to be mixed use projects uh 25 percent of the uh, floor area must be devoted to some other non self-storage use we do have a separating distance criteria of 5,000 feet between uh, self-storage facilities. Um, so that only, that only opens up a couple of properties in town for this kind of thing, given the fact we have existing facilities in town. Um, there's a whole bunch of design criteria, which is in section J uh, regarding the um, exterior and architectural treatment of these buildings. Um, there's some screening requirements. Uh, the material has to be decorative material. We did put some language in there that the Planning and Zoning Commission may tweak a few of the um, regulations in place. For example, if somebody wanted to put a five-story self-storage, even though we only, uh, our maximum right now is four stories, the commission under certain, certain conditions could grant uh, some flexibility. Um, and then I put some language in there at the very end, which I don't think we talked about the last time we met to deal with the existing self storage facilities. Uh, those existing facilities under these new regulations would become what they call non conforming. Usually, non conforming properties cannot be um, expanded uh, in any way because it increases the non conformity. So, I put some language in there that gives some flexibility uh, that those facilities, if they wanted to. Um, improve or add units, um, they could do that as long as they uh, came in through the Planning and Zoning Commission for that uh, conversation. So I didn't want to completely eliminate the possibility of those existing facilities having some ability uh, to further develop. Um, so that language was added in there to deal with those non-conforming facilities based on these regulations. So those are basically the highlights. So yeah, I would appreciate any, any feedback. Peter I, I, Peter, I checked this stuff out. I, I looked through it and I looked at my notes on everything we said in the past. And uh, I think you pretty well covered in these regulations, everything that, uh, you know, we all asked for. So, uh, you know, they look, look fine to me, even okay. with that addition. I have a question or clarification. Can you go through item B and C in section in under number three, whether it's a single building, it needs 50% of ground floor area yep. versus a multi-building with the 25%? Yeah. So you, you want to, you want to just understand the distinction between those two? Yeah. Can you just clarify it? Sure. Let me just read it um, here for a second. Okay. So it's the difference between a, uh, a, a, a single building project and yeah. a multi-building project. So the single building project, if you were to have uh, self-storage and something else within one building, you must have 50% of the ground floor area to be something other than self-storage. Self yeah. And then in a multi-building 
uh, facility. Um, 25% of the total project square footage must be devoted to um, non self storage use. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you can have the self storage yeah. could be a building in its, of itself, yeah. and then you could have two other buildings that have to be a minimum of 25% of the total. 100,000 square feet or whatever the whole project is. That could meet that. So that would meet the, mi the mixed use criteria. Okay. So in that case, a self storage doesn't need to have any retail in it, for example. It could just be a dedicated self storage building if there's other buildings that, uh, that take up the retail other use office. Yeah, so if, we, if you want to use the 1000 Silas Dean Highway um, property as an example, assuming the building was demolished. If you wanted to put a self storage facility uh, on the property, you would have to have a couple of other pad sites that would be whether it's restaurant or office or whatever on the property that meets that criteria. Okay, thank you. Peter, did we not say that that uh, business portion could not be office, just offices for the self storage? Yes, because I think there's some language elsewhere in here about that. Yeah, there has to be something else other yeah. than just their own office. Yeah, I'm, I'll, make an, I'll make a note and see if I clarified that somewhere else in here. Yeah. Peter, can you uh, explain how we got to the 5,000 feet? Um, is, does, I know we were talking about a mile and a half or half a mile and how and, and how it is that 5,000 feet wound up uh, yep. being the right amount. Um, I looked at other communities regulations. There weren't a lot of communities that have those kind of separating distances. So that didn't provide a lot of guidance. Um, I, I took out our zoning map and applied a couple of different radiuses and um, looked at what properties would be left uh, the mile and a half really com almost completely restricted the ability to do anything. Uh, the 5,000, which is basically close to a mile, um, provides a little more opportunity, not a lot more. And lastly, it's a, it's a round number rather than 5,280 or whatever the, whatever a mile is, pardon, pardon me. But um, so, and most of the other regulations that do, other towns that do have regulations, they are kind of round numbers rather than a, you know, mile and a half, which would be, I, I'll have to do the math. It's, it becomes a kind of a crazy little number, but um, those are primarily the reasons we came up with the 5,000. But I did apply it uh, here in town to kind of see what the, and that will be a, um, a graphic that I share with the Planning and Zoning Commission so they understand what that means. Any other questions on self storage? Okay, good. Thank you, Pete. Okay. Um, thank you, guys. Uh, the business outreach initiative, uh, you guys should have a couple of slices in this lengthy packet that Peter and Denise sent out um, showing uh, the, uh, the envelope. Peter, did you guys send out the actual a copy of the letter as well that we crafted? I, got, I see the envelope, but I don't see a copy of the actual letter. Yeah, we were trying to remember where we left off with that. I thought we were just going to use the envelope as not only the mailer and the return envelope, but also the letter. So at the top, uh, which would be folded down when they sent it back to us, was going to be the area that we wrote whatever message um, we felt was appropriate and what we have um, right now in that draft is what we thought the message was, was going to be. Um, I can maybe pull this up on the screen if that helps. Um, okay, um, and does anyone else remember it that way? Um, my brain is mush. The last seven months have killed me, um, like everybody else, but 
Um, I thought that we did have something else that went along to explain what we were doing other than the envelope, but I could be wrong. And I think we need a letter of, it, okay. it doesn't have to be lengthy, but I think that people need to have a letter in the envelope or with the envelope so that they have a better understanding of who the EDIC is, um, what our purview is, and, um, you know, ask for their opinions on, on different things and, and maybe list how we can help them. I think that's how we left it last time was the letter was going to be in the envelope with this envelope to go out to all the businesses. Right. And there okay. should be a letter, I think, that we slice and diced at the end, Pete, somewhere. Um, okay. I may have it. Um, I can dig for it now, but I'd be no, afraid. I'm sure, I'm sure we it. have it or we have it documented somewhere. So um, I can um, track that down. But I, I, we thought that this was going to form that message in this um, <laughs> underside of the envelope. But um, so there weren't too many moving parts with a letter and an envelope and that kind of thing. So but um, we can certainly do that. If you could find that letter and send it to everybody so we can take sure. a look at it. Because um, yep. I think what we're going to do, Pete, was that envelope. I think we took the, uh, the new buy here, um, 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 buy Weathersfield uh, logo that we developed with the website, yep. the shop yep. We we're going to put that uh, sticker inside that envelope as well. Okay. Um, uh, and the reason why I mentioned that is you and I were talking the other day, you know, the whole idea, if you guys remember, and I'm sure you do, maybe I'm just refreshing my memory, uh, but it's really just to get a tighter rein on communication with the business community. Um, and really the idea behind it was at the very minimum, we wanted to at least get email addresses from um, roughly the 700 businesses that were not affiliated with us right now on the town site, on our own uh, site now, uh, was to reach out. So I think there was another seven or 800 businesses that we don't have an updated information on. And in light of what's happened over the last six, seven months since we really visited this, um, I think the whole idea in that letter, I wanted to add uh, that, you know, in light of things with COVID going on, that, that these are the things that have come up where the town would like to be able to reach the business community. And Pete, I think you had mentioned that the, uh, the chief uh, had mentioned um, that uh, police was interested in having more of an accurate list of the business owners as well. So, which would aid the police if they have to, for whatever reason, um, contact the business community in a, in a quick, effective manner. So, if you could pull up that letter, um, I really want to jump on this. Uh, you know, yeah. if we can have this done and ready for the first year, you know, the timing is right in the sense that Happy New Year, um, um, you know, welcome 2021. I can't wait for 2020 to go. Um, I don't know if we want to put that in the letter, but um, that's, I think, addressing the, the nature of COVID. And frankly, we're, I mean, we've had some success with the outreach, the webinar done on phase two and phase three, but we've counted on Deb Raymond and the chamber to reach out. We reached out. I think if we had that email list where we could reach out to those people, we could get a lot more people, even though we had a good um, um, attendance to those, I think we could have even more attendance and more effectiveness with that. So Mark, I just wanted to add one thing as well. So I think you're right on target from the stuff that we had met about and including the letter. Um, you know, I think others, you know, on the committee here will also agree that um, we need to be more nimble. We've got to get this thing out. We've got to get those email addresses and then we've got to get going. You know, we've got to go electronic. We've got to stop this paper mail business um, as quickly as possible would be my opinion. It's the same opinion I'd share for years past as well. Um, so I, I think the sooner we can go out, the sooner we can get that first big batch, great, consolidate them with whatever other batches we have. Um, but immediately start getting this stuff into, you know, the, the central email distribution channel. Um, we, you know, we've got to be more nimble. Because I think if we're more nimble as a town, I mean, we can reach them faster. Just like you said, for whether it's the police department or anyone else. Uh, we're just, you know, we're like a carrier in the ocean right now. It takes a long time for us to turn. We need to be a small motorboat. <laughs> we got to be able to turn and be more nimble, in my opinion, with communications. If we want to be effective. Um, I think it's just such an effective way to do it. You're going to get some people that um, will really utilize the channel. Um, and then you're going to get a lot of others that will just simply be receivers of it. They'll be happy to receive it on a regular basis, but maybe not contribute too much. But either way, um, we end up really becoming more nimble if we can get digital and really just build this nice gold list of all businesses 
and be able to communicate on a regular basis at the drop of a hat. So I appreciate Peter, what you I, said. Uh, thank you for crystallizing that, Marco. I agree. Um, why don't we establish a marketing meeting after this meeting and let's get, to, Peter, if you can get that letter out to all of us. Um, is it possible also to get the company who we've been dealing with on designing the mailer and whatnot at our meeting? So maybe we can, you know, discuss with them the final concepts, unless you're deep into it already. And the, um, you, uh, my guess is maybe it's been modified a little bit since we're saying we have a letter to go with that this envelope is going to go in an envelope. Whether or not you think it's a good idea to have that company, I think it's a local company at that meeting, just to put a bow on this thing, like I said, I, I agree. It needs to get done. Um, do you think having them there um, would be uh, feasible? Um, oh, it's, it's, um, it's the local print shop across the street, basically. I'm sure they'd be happy to sit in as long as it's not a, you know, we would probably do a Zoom call, right? Yeah, yep. yep. Um, so what I would do is why don't we get um, that letter out to everyone we will schedule a marketing meeting early next week um, and, and, and let's get this bad boy going. Um, the bones are all, it's been fleshed out basically. I think we just need to add a couple of items regarding reasons why they should participate uh, in giving us the information that we're requesting. Um, I just, it's a more compelling argument now than it was um, seven, eight months ago, frankly. Were there any comments while we're all together um, on the, contents or the questions that are on this draft in case uh, some of you can't attend our marketing meeting? I'd like to add one thing which you and I discussed. You know, I, I met with Deb uh, Raymond and Pete O'Keefe uh, earlier in the week from the chamber um, on how the EDIC and chamber can work closer uh, together. Um, and I, we also mentioned that we'd like to get a mention on the importance of the Chamber of Commerce. I don't want it to sound like an advertisement for them, but if they have an interest in the Chamber of Commerce, it's an important organization um, with a uh, contact information for Deb in the Chamber uh, uh, in that letter as well. Any thoughts on that, guys? Deb, I know you're good with it. I know, thank you for that plug. Okay. Um, yeah, we really appreciate that. We're trying very hard to uh, connect with all the local businesses. Any that email questions? list would be awesome. Great, thank you, Deb. Any other questions on business outreach? Great. So for those of you that can make the meeting next week, we'll schedule it early next week. Um, it will be a, a quick down and dirty uh, Zoom meeting, no more than 30 minutes, but everybody review the letter that we crafted um, and we'll make some um, suggestions and we'll get it done by the end of that meeting so we can get this off to the printer. And Pete, if you can reach out to the company that you guys have been working with to be yep. a part of the Zoom call, that would be great. Sure. Okay. Salute to business. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, uh, all right, Pete, I'll go first. Um, from a salute to business perspective, um, you know, we tossed it around what I thought were some very uh, novel and uh, interesting ideas uh, um, regarding um, a potential presentation using Putnam Park um, or maybe doing a small gathering, et cetera. Um, I think at this point, um, the whole idea is to have a comfortable uh, evening uh, where people can sit back and relax and enjoy uh, the fruits of them being uh, recognized uh, here in town, along with their family and other people in their businesses, etc. And I don't know if we can really get there right now in light of everything that's going on, not in a way that I think would be um, bulletproof. Anything we do outside is going to be subject to weather. Um, I, you know, I'm, uh, again, I'm I'm a glass half full type person, but I'm having a hard time getting there on this. Um, what are you guys' thoughts? Uh, we certainly know that we can't do it during the, the traditional model and doing it at the club, country club, and et cetera, et cetera. That is obviously out at this point. Um, um, you know, we've thought about finding a later date, maybe doing potentially something in the spring 
or holding off, you know, until next year, like a lot of other events. I told Pete, you know, Judy and I aren't doing the, the carnival this year. It doesn't mean we're not going to try to do it next year at the same time. But what are your guys' thoughts as a group on the uh, salute to business? I feel like we should do something to recognize businesses in town, especially for pulling through during this time. Um, you know, people who've stayed open or who've been able to expand or help the community in any way. Um, I understand how another, a separate event might not work. And if we don't want to do a virtual event, could we do something maybe connected to the state of the town where we where you know, that's well attended too. And, do something there, just even a PowerPoint or a short video highlighting things that happened. Just a thought. Okay. When do we do that? March, February, or February, no, March? January. No, the state, if I could mention that, um, because of the phase three opening, we are going to try and go ahead with the state of the town breakfast at the Keeney Center because we could have 100 people. I spoke with them. So combining that might be a great idea. I'm working on getting that organized this week. So um, January 16th is the date. Yeah, January 16th. How well attended is that, Deb, in the past? What have the numbers been like? Very well attended. So we're hoping, I mean. Is that usually a Saturday? No. Uh, no. It's a morning. It's, it's like, like a Monday or Tuesday, Tuesday morning. morning. Like it's like 8 o'clock eight o'clock in the morning, yeah. Right. January 16th is a Saturday. Yeah. It is? Yep. Ah. Hmm, that's the date Keeney gave me. I'll, I'll come back to you with that date then. The, um, the reason, it'll be that week. Asked, the reason why I asked Deb if it was well attended, you know, um, a poorly attended event of ours is how many, Pete? Um, what's the lowest number that we've had? Uh, 110, maybe. Yeah, so we did discuss the fact that there's going to have to be a cutoff, and I think that it's going to be wherever we have it. Um, yeah, but it'll have to be a cutoff with the first come, first serve with tickets, I guess. It, could you know, it be if broadcast? The way it is. What's that? Could it be broadcast? Like, could you have X number of attendees, but if you if you miss, you know, if you're if you're locked out because you didn't get your ticket early enough, could you join for a discounted price virtually and attend that way? Maybe Marco could help us with that. I don't know. We do a Zoom. We do a Zoom. Uh, I, yeah. There's too many people in each group to possibly do it together. Um, yeah. uh, Mark, well, I'm disappointed that we're between... not... Uh, go, go ahead. I'm sorry, there's overlap between who attends. Yeah. You know yeah, what I mean? Like, but but that's still a large number. Yeah. Um, I, I think we should have done the drive-through <laughs> at Putnam Park. I think that would be unique and fun and uh, everybody's relatives could come and be in another car. You know, it would allow us to have as many people there as you want. Well, we would have to, uh, Judy, if we do that, we'd have to do it in the next 30 to 60 days before the snow flies, right? So we would have to, there's a, if doing a new venue like that, and again, I'm, if, if the group thinks that that's the right thing to do, I'd call in the group and as a, as a group together, plan it. Um, but, you know, we're, you know, um, five weeks away from Thanksgiving. Um, I, I just don't know how quick we could get this put together. Um, again, if the group is it, I'll be the first one uh, in line with everybody to help organize it. But I just want to make sure that, we look at all the different aspects of it. We are weather related. If it's cold and rainy, or God forbid it's snowing, um, you know, uh, these are things that we need to take uh, into account. Has anybody talked to River to see what their thoughts are? Um, I, I haven't, but my guess is they would have no problem with it. You know, especially, you know, we'd have to do it on a, you know, a, during the day on, and on a weekend, obviously. So it would have to be a Saturday or Sunday and, uh, the restaurant begins to die down. I doubt they would have an issue. I'm not. Don't mean to speak for uh, for 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 the Hennies, but my guess is they'd be okay with it. They probably would like it. I, I would be happy to 
kind of look into how it could happen um, if any, anybody else is interested. I'm just yeah. concerned about the weather impacts. I mean, we can't predict that if we put a lot of effort into scheduling it, marketing it, inviting people, and then on a Saturday we get a weather event that we can't control, um, then all of that's, you know, back to square one to reschedule. So I, I'm just concerned about something like that, that is going to be outside and could be factored in by the, the elements. So I, I, if, if the Keeney can handle 100, maybe we, ju we don't piggyback on, um, on the state of the town. We, we do something separate date, separate time, you know, in the, in the, in the winter sometime. Uh, it would be a problem also if it's 8 a.m. for a lot of the businesses, I think, who might get the awards to be there that time of day rather than at nighttime. So just a couple of my concerns. Can the, how many can the country club hold safely under the new um, reopening? Yeah, so we have, to, we have to go back and talk to them. Initially, it was only 25, but those numbers obviously go up after phase three, but I'm not sure what their 50% occupancy is. We'll have to investigate that and find out. The problem too is the six foot distancing within between. So yeah. that's where it's going to be tricky. I was actually contemplating even if the community center could hold a suitable amount of people and even that would kind of be tricky um, just because it has you you have to hit the six foot distancing and that's where it's going to start to get compressed. The, the oh. country club can, uh, their maximum is 198 when it's at full capacity. So 50% of that. About 100. Yep. Yeah, about 100. All right, we can look at different options and see what. Do you, do you think it's easier to, um, just thinking now, instead of having like a sit down dinner, to ha is it safer to have like a cocktail mingling event? Is that safer? Probably not. Yeah, <laughs> probably not. I know. Bars are still closed. Everybody would have their mask off to eat or whatever. But we could uh, reduce the, uh, not have a dinner, just have it be hors d'oeuvres or apps that you take to your table and, and mm -hmm. eat. It would be cheaper in the long run. I um, do uh, self-service. I think talking to all the restaurants, it seemed like uh, to me that they all have to be served, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. What if it's a box style? Uh, yeah. yeah, that they could pick up on their way in maybe. You know, I think we're taking all the fun out of it, Judy. You know, you're picking up your box of stuff and you're going to sit down and it doesn't, and not, it just seems like, um, I think we're trying to, to put a three pound cat into a two pound bag. Um, I think there's, you can't do it and the cat gets pissed off. And I, I'm just, I'm concerned that um, we're trying to rush something. You know, the, there is not going to be an outpouring of uh, pitchforks and torches on, on the EDIC and RDA that we didn't have the event this year, I have a feeling that some of the people that we might invite may not even want to be comfortable to come. I mean, we still have people that you know, won't go into restaurants, even though it's okay. Uh, they won't eat outside. I know many of them are my friends that still just are very, very fearful, which I respect. So I just think there's too much stuff going against it. I think we should, my personal feeling is we should take our time. Let's find a month when, when the comfort level is significantly better. Um, where we can plan this and, and to be the nice, fun, warm, socialized event that it's been in the past. Um, I have no problem nominating people and maybe informing people that, hey, you were on the list this year and, and, um, and we want to let you know that sometime in 2021, we're going to have this event, but we want to know that we were going to host an event with you. We could even present them, present them the award, send them the award, make a visit to them. I have no issue with any of that and saying we're gonna do it later on. And in, I'm glad I mentioned that, but, and I was telling Pete, I think in the future, once we get back into whatever normalcy is, I think we should notify these people three, four months before the event, because that gives them a lot more time to talk to people that might wanna come and gives them, and I think we'd have even uh, more attendance uh, at the event as well. Um, those Mark, are my can I just thoughts. have one thing when you're done? I'm sorry. Please, Marco, go ahead. Um, so one, one other thought, and I, I hate coming up with these ideas because then I have to figure out how we're going to fulfill them. Um, so another thought, so I totally agree with um, Joya and I agree with everyone who wants to have the event, obviously Judy as well. 
Um, I think it has been a special year for all the right and wrong reasons. Um, what if, you know, what if we did something totally different, like really out of the box different? And my out of the box different is, what if we actually do recognize people and we notify them now or soon? Um, what if we ask each group or each, you know, recipient to essentially prepare a, a video, a small video, uh, where we can stitch all those videos together. Um, you could certainly be like Mark as a chairperson, you can certainly, um, or somebody, you know, a couple people on the committee could get together, also be vi on video, essentially stitch together a number of video clips where each one of those is recognized. And assuming we have this nice business directory list and whatever other email list we can cobble together, um, share that with people. Um, just as a way of saying, hey, 2020, you weren't forgotten, any stretch. Um, but also being able to recognize them. Like we would like literally tell each group, all we want you to do is, you know, state your name, um, introduce who you are, um, talk about the, you know, the work you do and the award or the, you know, the recognition that you were given, um, keep it under two or three minutes or under two minutes or under a minute and a half and, and beyond. I just was thinking about, like if I was watching a video at least of all of that, um, there wouldn't be a whole lot of pressure at that time. There'd just be pressure to produce the video. Um, but as far as actually being live and having to do some kind of synchronous event, um, it would take that away. But I'm just thinking more of a creative option to still give recognition where recognition is due. Marco um, and everybody, we did that for the best of uh, awards this year at the chamber. And I have to say, all the business owners had such a good time with their staff putting this video together. I mean, sure. they got creative. They were you know, celebrating each other, and we um, delivered our their plaques prior to these videos so that they could, uh, you know, show them on the videos. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, it, it, it was great. I can send you the link to that if anybody wants to see it. It's great. Yeah. So it's a great suggestion. Deb, who did you guys use to, uh, to edit it? Did somebody in the, in, in the chamber do it, or was it you know, somebody pulled out the Apple video uh, software and, and do it together. How did you guys do it? Uh, to be honest, uh, Elena actually had a huge, huge part in putting that video together. And, you know, it was really her knocking on doors of people that she knew how to do it, you know, favors. And uh, there is a couple of us uh, in the chamber who went around to all the businesses, you know, made an appointment with them, you know, the people I visited, I brought balloons and, you know, had a great time with them, you know, just giving them the awards. Um, so it was grassroots. So I can find out from her. Well, we have Marco, right? <laughs> Sorry, Marco. <laughs> Cause I, I'm not the person to ask for that, but I'm certainly. This is why I hate coming up with these ideas. I know <laughs> I can ask her though, but I no, mean, but I, I, I can help, help for sure. sure. Yeah. I'm happy to go around delivering to businesses though. And, you know, happy to help with the legwork of all that. You know, who's a quick study is that guy, Mike Rell. He's a quick study, I heard, so. <laughs> um, how about Jesse? Jesse Smith. Absolutely, Jesse. Um, sure would be he would be a great one to do it. He's Absolutely. done some great videos for the historic um, district. and mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be super produced. It's more yeah. about getting these nice, authentic videos of each of the recipients. I mean, that's really what it's about. It's kind of like what Deb was saying. You know, it's just they have fun with it. It's very authentic. Uh, it's low key, low pressure. Uh, the logistics of, you know, with Judy, where you were trying to go, which I totally agree with. I would love to do something in person always. Um, we're just in a, in a tough spot still. You know, Dolan um, Dental got uh, one of the awards and he was telling me that it was great because it kind of not pushed him because I think they have a great uh, work environment down there, but kind of pushed him to then after they did this video to have their own little party and celebrate together, which he normally would probably would not have done. So there's a lot of pluses to that. I, I'm all for it. Well, it takes the weather element out of it for sure. Is it like Publishers Clearinghouse? Do you show up at their own with a big check? Um, and I mean, I, you could I have some like fun. That. It's a novel idea. Um, I, no I check. Think the, <laughs> um, the the beauty of it um, is that, and the difficulty, and I think you said yourself, Marco, logistically, just getting the owners, the people you nominate to do the video, um, would be the the hardest part. And then we're putting a lot of the onus on them, which I'm not saying is a bad thing or a good thing, but that would be 
they'd have to supply us with the video, but we could try it. I don't, um, I don't think that part would be too hard. We just have to put a little storyboard together just to, to discuss like, you know, just the sequence of, of things. That's really the main thing. Um, and again, it doesn't have to be super high end produced. It's, it can be a little grassroots and a little bit more bootstrap. That's okay. Um, you know, it's not too, too hard to do really. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to help out with it. Um, but maybe that's something that is another, did I just say happy? All right. I'm not happy, but I would help. Out. Willing. <laughs> I think you meant to say I'd willing, not happy. All right. Willing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah so. I'd be willing to help out on that as well. Um, so why don't we do this? Would you like to add this to our marketing meeting agenda uh, next week when we talk about the um, uh, the commute, the outreach uh, letter? Uh, I think this would fit neatly into that as well. Would that be all right? Yep, that's fine. We uh, we drafted up a uh, list of possible awardees, so we can email that out along with the uh, letter in advance of the meeting, so people can think about whether we missed anybody. Um, because there is a because of the COVID, there's a whole bunch of new businesses that we didn't get to have ribbon cuttings for, so we would like to add them in uh, this year as well. So, so it'll be, I would it'll say be a lot. There'll be a lot more awards than last year, but that's that's uh, I think that's makes okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I would suggest that we use the video to also have the um, photo contest uh, winners in. So just like Mark, when you use them as a uh, background for your PowerPoint, maybe intersperse the, um, the picture, the winners in between the videos. Sure, that's a great idea. Guys, you filled up my cup. Uh, I couldn't get the half full and you, uh, that was a good idea and I appreciate it. And we will discuss this deeper uh, at the marketing meeting that we'll schedule at the end. Um, any other questions or comments on the um, salute to business? Okay, uh, town guide and calendar, Pete. Well, it's that time of year again, so we're gearing up for that. We, I believe, Denise yesterday sent out a an initial uh, notice to people to start gathering up the information or updating your graphics and that kind of thing. So we'll need. Uh, an updated letter from you, Mark. We'll need um, from Mike as well, the mayor's message to include that. And then mm -hmm. we'll do the usual, uh, we have a chamber ad in there. So you may wanna look, Deb, you may wanna look at that and see what uh, changes. I think um, we're giving everybody until November, November 1st, Denise, is that right? November 2nd, um, uh, as uh, time will rapidly be upon us to put this together. So we're gonna stick with the same number that we did last year, uh, but we just need everything um, updated and refreshed. So if you have contributed in the past, please start working on that for us. Great. Um, I know we talked welcome wagon pretty uh, significantly last time around. What, what loose ends do we have around welcome wagon? Oop, uh, we're just waiting for people to contribute you know, their uh, literature, their tchotchkes, that kind of thing. We've had a couple uh, come in already, um, but it has not been um, overwhelming. So I'm not sure what that um, is due to, maybe the COVID or, or, or something like that. So um, we've given them a little bit more time and uh, we'll continue to work on that. So if you are in touch with the business and they want to take advantage of that, um, have them drop off uh, the material here at the office as soon as they can. I, I have not gotten a great response on that for some reason, and I put yeah. it out a couple of times. Yeah, neither have yeah. we. So I don't know. We In the past, we have. We've gotten a lot of people to contribute pens and magnets and literature. Um, yeah. So we just have to keep uh, uh, plugging away at that. Um, as they say, I don't know how to explain it. Well, can I just add one more piece? And I'm sorry, oh, it, it, it kind of goes down the path of video as well for some new people. But as far as like businesses that come to town, um, I honestly forget all of the different resources that we have even on the on the business side on the website for the town. Um, but I'm just wondering if you know maybe when these um, maybe when these organizations and, and new um, new companies do set up shop, 
uh, maybe they can just submit a, a two minute video every time it gets posted right on the page. It gets blasted out to this new list of 700, 800 emails. Um, let's, let's, you know, percolate, let's show like how nimble we can be to celebrate the new business that's in town. Um, let them you know, let them send us a few still shots, a small video clip, um, if they want to, and then maybe they can be featured on the website. So like think honestly, like of a business directory that literally just has a small video profile with it for those who don't know the business might be another nice little unique way to give people a little more personal touch. Cause a lot of those businesses have gotten away from tchotchkes altogether. They've pulled them from everywhere. They don't want people touching anything. Um, so maybe that's part of the reason why we're seeing that decline. Um, your point on the video, I think is great. I mean, I think we can, again, look, we'll add that to the agenda in the marketing meeting. Um, uh, you're gonna get, you get two stars on your report today, Marco. Um, I'm going to put a turkey on there for Thanksgiving and a pumpkin for Halloween. You're going to get both of those. Great. <laughs> um, business Mark, incentive. Mark, Mark, we don't have a budget for that. So, <laughs> actually, I was just thinking. I have to disagree. We haven't served these guys lunch in seven months. So I'm thinking we get together. We should do lobster and champagne uh, at the uh, next uh, uh, meeting we get together. Um, okay. On the business incentive programs, Pete, what is that in relationship to? Is that tying with what we discussed last week? Yeah, I think um, you and Gary and I probably need to sit down first, flesh that out uh, as to what we can and can't do, and then uh, maybe bring that back. Or if we want to do a, um, a finance subcommittee meeting to flesh that out. But probably you and I and Gary just need to sit down first and... Um, discuss what's possible um, and um, and then maybe bring it back to the to bigger group with the initial idea rather than just sit around and brainstorm first. Yeah, I, I mean, we could, um, Gary, do you want to give like just from the 30,000 feet what we discussed last week um, just quickly and, you know, we don't really have a lot yet to share, but in essence, um, one of the tools in our toolbox that we do not have uh, is money. And we had a great conversation with Paul and with Tom, you know, around Masonic and outreach uh, um, and whatnot. Um, and we can do a lot of these things. And I think we've, if you put the boxes out, we check them all off. Um, what we don't have are, uh, in our toolbox is money um, to help uh, develop, to help incentivize. Um, and Gary, I'm gonna pass the torch uh, over to you to kind of discuss um, uh, our meeting last week, if that's all right with you. Yeah, that, that's fine. Um, it's um, it will probably be that thirty thousand foot level uh, because it is very preliminary. But we did start with a conversation with Michael Freemuth, who is the uh, executive director for the Capital Region Development Authority or CRDA. For those who are not familiar with CRDA, um, without kind of giving you a breakdown, but if you think about projects like the Borden, Adrian's Landing. Um, and there's several others. Um, they are, for lack of a better term, they are part of a capital stack. They help leverage existing public-private funding out there, and they fill, look to fill in the gap to make these projects go through. Um, they have decades of experience kind of as an economic development engine uh, within the region. We are part of that region, so we're looking to tap them for their knowledge base as well as any potential um, you know, capital stacks and any funding that might be available. Um, so Peter, Mark and I had a great meeting with Mike. He actually came to town, um, kind of gave him an overview of RDA and EDIC and the types of projects we were looking at, some of the conversations that we're having with existing property owners and building owners, some of the barriers and impediments that are coming up as part of it. Um, and to maybe tap his knowledge to see how we can um, help stimulate the region and frankly capitalize on the fact that the board and if you consider the board and, and even um, the uh, Phoenix Realty, I can't think of the project over there, but um, with the 80,000 square feet of medical office space. Pure um, furniture. Thank you, the old Puritan furniture location. Those are kind of the pebbles that you drop in the water that create the ripple effect. And now's the time for us to continue keeping the pressure on so that the ripple continues out. 
I, I felt it was a great conversation. He had some interest in a number of the things that we talked about. Um, by interest, I meant I mean, not so much that he was there with a checkbook, but to say, you know what, these, these have some potential. This is what you need to flush out. So our follow-up conversation is really to talk about, okay, how do we start to flush some of those things out? Um, they did talk about um, CRDA is more of a value added, right? So they have the knowledge, they have the skill, they have some money, and they know how to kind of push some of the partners within the state and federal resources to get those. But they're also looking for the, the town to have uh, some skin in the game. And so that conversation um, is really where we're going. Um, again, where, you know, my recommendation is always to, uh, as I said to Peter and Mark, there are some potential things that we can tap into. We should flush those out and then bring it back to the bigger group um, to, to look at priorities. And then uh, Mayor Rao, this is the first you're probably hearing of it, but then we need to obviously have a conversation with you as well. Um, to mm -hmm. get level as the leader of the council. So, um, so again, yep. very preliminary conversations, but I think it's important to know um, organizations like CRDA with all the experience are sitting there saying, hey, we're for the right project, we're here to help. And it sounds like you have some potential projects. They're also help, They're also working with Newington just for comparison uh, purposes on their um, transit-oriented development uh, project there. So uh, they are branching out uh, into uh, areas other than Hartford and East Hartford, so uh, they're very uh, willing to do that. So it was a it was a it was a pretty positive meeting that we had with them. Any questions or comments on that, guys? Great. Um, that would take us to the town manager's report. Um, well, I'll hand you the torch again, Gary. I'm done. That's all. That was a big thing. Uh, yeah, most of it's just really touching base on a couple things. Um, we did, we did have an EDIC RDA meeting about two weeks ago. Um, so there, I don't want to repeat some of the things I've already talked about, and I apologize if I do. Um, just an update on um, coronavirus activity within the town. We're up to about 320. Um, confirmed cases, that's up about 20 over the last two weeks. So we are seeing um, even in town, the numbers start to slowly edge up. But for the most part, we've been knock on wood kind of stagnant in town for the last three months. Um, there, our, our death rate, uh, uh, while unfortunate that there is a number at all, it's remained low at 11. Our surrounding um, neighbors have not been um, as lucky. And a lot of that has to do with the, the fact that we don't have a lot of senior housing um, facilities in town or, or senior facilities in town. Um, I just earlier today had a meeting. Um, the state through the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection has created uh, a series of task force. Uh, the two that are most interesting to the town right now are the Municipal Solid Waste Reduction Initiative as well as an Equitable and Energy Efficiency Initiative. Uh, where game plan or our hope and the strategy is to tap some of the knowledge uh, and programs that other states and even countries are using to keep the cost related to municipal solid waste down. Um, right now in our budget, I think our costs for municipal solid waste are definitely in the top five in terms of pushing our mill rate upwards. Uh, it might even be, I'm pretty sure it's top two, um, two or three that are increasing our costs exponentially every year. It's just something that we can't keep up with, um, regardless of the size of our commercial versus residential tax base, uh, the cost is becoming just insurmountable. Um, it was a very informative and positive meeting. We're, we're again, first meeting, but we're looking at those uh, concepts that again, other states and even countries have been using to help defray the costs and Frankly, some of them are not a far stretch for Connecticut, um, which includes things like having the producers of the trash, those, whether it's a Walmart stop and shop uh, to pay a fee related to, um, at a, you know, the state level, uh, a fee associated with their, their packaging. Um, and they're already doing it in other states. Those same corporations are already paying that fee in other states. So it was kind of eye-opening and interesting to hear. Um, other things that are important, uh, housing management team, uh, for those of you who 
may or may not recall, um, as part of the new blight ordinance uh, that came out last year, we created a housing management team. Uh, unfortunately, everything kind of came to a halt for the most part come COVID because those same members of the housing management team overlap with the emergency operations center more or less, um, and are also a part of the group that are getting businesses up and running. They're your zoning enforcement officers, also your blight enforcement officer, planning, um, fire marshal, building code. Um, so a lot of those have been, we've been limping along, we've been working on it, but not as aggressive. We did have a meeting last week, um, which has more of a team oriented on how we approach the amount of issues related to property maintenance, which includes bright blight uh, for both commercial and residential property. Uh, we have a, I'll call it a short list of repeat offenders. Uh, and the game plan is to continue to increase our pressure on those repeat offenders to make sure that they're complying with those rules. Um, and, uh, and I think we have a pretty strong game plan. Um, oh, health department obviously being part of that group as well, which is why we kind of had to hold back. Uh, and social youth services, um, because again, one thing we're learning as we're hitting, seeing some of these repeat offenders on the residential side is it's simply, they don't have the financial wherewithal, they may be senior, they may have other issues or barriers to uh, being to maintain the property to the level that we need. So we wanted to make sure we're bringing in every resource, not just using the stick um, to, to achieve results. Um, right now within Town Hall, uh, we are still focusing on uh, appointment only. We had relieved that for a period of time during tax season, so we made sure people were coming in, but we are back to appointment only. Um, staff is working and still available to meet your needs, both online, over the phone, and in person. There are certain restrictions in place. Everybody is required to wear a mask uh, when they're in the common areas or coming into town hall. We do have, I didn't get the number today, but we're around somewhere plus or minus 6,000 to 7,000 absentee ballots in process, requests in process. For those of you who are unaware, um, different from the primary, the state has now pushed the responsibility to the municipalities. So if you're, um, they paid for the letters to go out to all the residents or to all the registered voters to say, if you're interested in voting by absentee, um, you know, please fill out this letter, but now the letters are coming to us and we have to process the ballots. Uh, which needless to say with somewhere around 18,000 voters in town, it's not something we can just easily process. We have no staffing, um, but we figured out a way. We've brought in some um, through what's supposed to be reimbursed through the state, uh, uh, some part-time individuals to help sort those. And we're already up to 6,000, 7,000 absentee ballots and we're a little less than a month away. We anticipated 10 to 12,000 ballots being processed. So town hall has become a, manufacturing center or processing center at this point, uh, or the chamber has at least. Um, Gary, how many, we, how many total voters are there in our town? I want to say we're at 18,000. 18,000. Yep, and we're anticipating 12 to 15 are going to do app or at least apply for absentee and we're about halfway there. Um, a lot of retirements. Uh, coming through, coming down the line uh, within town hall, uh, and I'm short a human resources director, so we're doing our best to process those um, and figure out if there's opportunities to restructure within departments. Um, some of those are harder than you would think to do. Uh, Keisha Farm update, uh, we um, were unable due to funding restrictions. I think I mentioned this at the last one, um, you know, the numbers that came in for a consultant were a little higher than anticipated. Um, so funding was obviously not going to be in place. And with everything going on with COVID, it was kind of, you know, if there's an opportunity to kind of squeeze, uh, squeeze the money to hold it just to wait to see what was going to happen. We felt it was appropriate for resident, um, from a protecting your tax dollar standpoint. Uh, however, in an interesting turn, we're trying to partner with local universities um, to provide us that a quality um, opportunity to analyze potential reuses for Keisha, which could include um, the, the work that these students could do could include just, you know, um, engineering studies, environmental impact studies, um, uh, surveys with residents, um, and just, you know, to a lower level, well, 
what I'm hearing from the advisors is they'll be very professional, but I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna just to be safe, say it'll probably be lower level than what a consultant being paid specifically to work on our project would be. Um, but most of the proposals that I've seen are pretty unique, pretty impressive. And what I like about it is it's a true grassroots community oriented approach. We're trying to get youth and students actively involved. Um, and so we're also building their knowledge and their experience, but also creating a nice pathway. And our hope is to tie that into some of the high school students in terms of marketing, graphic design, and, um, and outreach to the community. So it's, it's kind of a unique twist um, based off of having a lack of funding to use partners within the local area. Um, more to come as I get more information, nothing set in stone at this point, we're just working through a process. Uh, other things of interest, uh, two lots of funded projects for road reconstruction, Walker Hill Road, uh, received a tranche of funding. Um, we're working with the engineers to get that up and moving. Um, a secondary component of that is thanks to Senator Fonfara and the rest of the delegation. Uh, we were able to secure another half a million dollars um, for that uh, the gateway um, on Walker Hill Road to try to do improvements to that center uh, island, as we discussed in the last meeting. And then on the other end of town at another gateway, we have the Highland Street Road construction um, I did mention this after the last meeting, um, and uh, Mayor, I apologize, I don't want to step on your toes for council reports, uh, but, uh, but the council did approve at the, not the last meeting, the last meeting in September, um, funding to hire a consultant and award that contract, and we are pushing to try to get that done this fall. Uh, other little things, Knott Street, um, Knott Street, Heather Road, Heather Street, we are going to, we're working on engineering, re-engineering drainage over there. There are some drainage issues and I'll actually stop there because I think we're, that's probably more than enough. Oh, one last thing I do want to mention. Nope, never mind. I'll move on. Like the against the knife commercial, there's always one more. Uh, there's always something, a special offer at the end. Thank you, sir. Um, town Council? Maybe I'm that special offer. So um, I'll follow up with uh, what Gary had said. Uh, Gary actually did a great job. You know, you mentioned a lot of things that uh, I wanted to talk about. Uh, but one thing uh, from the council perspective, as we are in the middle of the campaign season, we do have an opening for um, the town clerk position. Uh, Dolores Sassano retired in August, and we are looking to fill that in the next couple days, uh, or not next couple days, but probably start interviewing in the next couple days, and then um, continue with the, uh, an interview process, hopefully have that in position. I don't think, Gary, if we could have that before the election, um, probably not. I'm just trying to think timing-wise not to have the town clerk uh, in before the election. Um, be ideal, but I don't know, hiring wise, if it could be done possibly. Um, Anything's but, possible. It depends upon the candidate selected and what their current job status is. So if they have to leave another position, yep. they may not, they may have to give, a, you know, more than two weeks notice depending upon the position. So. Right. Yep. Um, may as I'm looking. Do you have a job description uh, What's that? Anything for that? Do you have a job description or anything for any of us that might be able to send potential candidates? I believe the position was advertised and has closed it's at this closed. point. I think we're now at the phase uh, for interviews. Okay. Yep. Yep. And we're compiling a team to uh, to conduct those interviews. Um, one of the things I also wanted to mention, and thanks, Gary, for uh, um, sending me the quick text about it, but uh, there are a uh, a number of concerns that people have uh, brought up about Brainerd Airport, and uh, um, I'm looking at the. <laughs> Judy Keene in the center of my screen, nodding her head, Deb, uh, Mark, myself, um, you know, we all live in the flight path uh, that shouldn't be a flight path. Uh, there is concern, obviously, with the sound of the airplanes going overhead. Um, it is being addressed. We are working with Brainerd Airport, like we always have, with um, them providing uh, information to pilots that they should not be uh, flying over Old Weathersfield, that they should be um, using the recommended flight path over the river. Uh, 
I, you know, I try not to blame everything on COVID, but you know, I gotta be honest with you. There's a lot of people who are taking pilots license because they have the time and, and are, I have always wanted to do it. Um, that has increased air traffic, believe it or not, has increased as well. Um, all I can say is continue to make the calls to the airport, uh, noise committee, uh, or noise, um, line and let them know we do follow up we have a liaison we have a committee gary's on that committee kevin hill councilman kevin hills uh the liaison to that let him know that um also uh, as it pertains to brainerd airport because of um that flight path that leads into and out of uh, the airport it does go over town property and we do have uh, about 40 acres or so that is town property um, that they're looking to cut back, cut back, uh, trim, or even completely uh, cut down uh, trees in and out of the uh, airport uh, approach. It's in, I think, Tony, you and I were on the council three years ago when they first presented this to us. Um, it, it's now starting to come back to us because FAA is starting to put pressure on the CAA, Connecticut Airport Authority, uh, to clear those trees. There is a um, siting council or siting meeting with the DEEP coming up in the next week or two, uh, where we've asked uh, the CAA to provide uh, an opportunity for us uh, and residents to weigh in on the decision for that. Um, it's, it's a it's one of those where if you're in government or anything else, you got it's a perfect balancing act that you got to do. Um, obviously, trees provide uh, habitat for a number of uh, animals, including the endangered bald eagle. So we're going to have to keep um, a close eye on you know any activity down there. Um, you know we're prepared to uh, to work with the state on it. But we also realize the uh, the need for safety for the uh, the airport airplanes going in and out. Um, that's kind of you know with you know following up with what Gary said on on his report. That's really you know the focus right now on the town council. When is the meeting? Uh, you know I don't think I'm getting the emails. Is there is there a meeting scheduled with the airport? Is this for the DEP uh, siting? No, just for sure. general meetings that we used to have all the time. Uh, Gary? Ju yep, so, and Judy, I'll have to go back and look. I'm, I'm hoping I have the right address for you. So we, we're still meeting quarterly. We did not, um, I'm trying to think. We met, I think we met in July. I have to go back and look. We definitely met in April. No, we didn't meet in April. We did meet in July. It was a Zoom. Okay. Um, uh, just because, make sure I'm on that list. Would yeah, you let me double check. Yeah. We will, and this is this is on the agenda for the next one. We will, we're the third, we're the third Thursday of every quarter, or, or at the beginning of every quarter. So there's one coming up for October. I think it's the 15th. I'll have October to 15. Check. October 15. Yeah. yeah. So I'll have okay. to make sure if you didn't get that. I haven't set the agenda. But, I have but, not been getting them. Yeah. Okay. So I don't. Uh, I apologize for that. I I'll have to go back. That's to all right. Stay. If we have the right email, because I know you and I had emailed once before, and I, yeah. I think we were using a different email, so I'm wondering if the, if I might have forgotten to update it okay. there. That's uh, okay. I apologize. We will be setting at that October 16th, uh, 15th meeting, our meeting schedule for the next year because we have to get it to Pete to the calendar that Pete's working on. Um, in terms of Deep or Connecticut Airport, um, um, you know they they've they've requested a permit from the town. We're working through a process over here. I think, you know, the mayor, um, Representative Kerry Wood, um, I know Amy Bella was out there. I'm trying to think who else was out there with us, mayor. Uh, we walked the site as part of a cleanup. And then the mayor, uh, Representative Kerry Wood and myself were on a, 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 a phone call with uh, the authority. Um, and, you know, frankly, I think the discussion is gonna move to our meeting on the 15th as, as a whole. I don't see us moving forward really without communicating to uh, residents. I don't, I don't think we actually can, but we're also waiting to hear back from DEEP on what their process and their intentions are gonna be. Um, you know, I think they need to hear from the committee, I guess is my, is, you know, I, I got the sense, Mayor, and correct me if I'm wrong, that 
the Connecticut Airport Authority was kind of leading to the fact that DEEP's going to have to make a decision based off of the environmental assessment that took place. Um, and I don't know if there's a requirement. I, I've reached out to DEEP uh, recently, um, and I'm sure I'll get a hold of them shortly. I've reached out to them recently to talk about whether or not they're going to have to have a public process. They're because a public process, a public hearing process previously took place, I'm not sure what requirements they have to have another one. Um, that's not to say I haven't spoken to anyone. They haven't told me that they're going to not have one or they're not going to have one. I'm just saying that's kind of a curious question I have. Are you required to have more and are you going to accept more input? So um, that would absolutely be a topic of discussion for the Brainerd Airport Advisory Committee. Mm -hmm. Hey, Mike Carell, back three years ago when we were looking at this, uh, Senator Fonterra at the time was looking to probably squash the airport and turn it into an enterprise zone. Is he still looking into that or is that a dead issue? I think it's a dead issue. Um, in fact, we're hearing rumors that they're looking to expand the runway to uh, make it a more productive airport uh, for commercial and for um, businesses you know, around the area. But that is, I mean, other than just sheer rumors, there's, we asked, we asked uh, Kevin Dillon, the uh, executive director directly, and he said, no, there's no plans for that right now. Um, but um, yeah, I, I don't think there's any talk of, you know, getting rid of Brainerd Airport at all. Okay. Hey, uh, Mark. Mark, yes. it's, it's Paul. Hey, I just got pinged. I need to drop, but just to Kind of circle on something a quick comment both the gary's report mike's report and what peter was saying in the edic um i don't know if other people are seeing it but i'm hearing a lot of positive vibe around town from people um houses are selling new people are moving to town you see lots of people pushing strollers around with little kids um you know great uh, you know shout out to um all the town operations you got the new tennis courts and basketball court redone down at stillman i know a lot of people are excited about that saw them replacing the backstops at the baseball field. Millwoods is crowded with dog walkers. I think, um, you know, all things considered with COVID, uh, positive direction and, and sort of good energy in the town. So I think that's a, a testament to all the efforts that go on out there. Yeah. Thanks, I'll send Paul. You the check. I'll send you the check later, Paul. Thank you. Yeah, and, you know, on the Brainerd thing, by the way, I'll just leave you, you know, I'm glad you're extending that runway. I've had a little trouble getting the jet in. I mean, I've asked the pilot to stay over the river, but, um, you know, that new runway will help. You sound really good. You're on the plane now, from what I understand. You're coming in clearly. That's <laughs> you why we never see you. All right, thank you, Paul. I know you've got a split, but thank you for your comments today. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mayor, thank you for your report, P&Z. Um, do we have a substitution for our friend, Mr. Silver, as of yet for PNZ? Not yet. I'll put it on the next uh, PNZ agenda. Okay. Anything worthy of note on the PNZ side, or are we good? Uh, there's a couple of small projects uh, working their way through the uh, permit process. Um, no, nothing, nothing uh, note, noteworthy. Um, okay. There is a... Um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll bring it up under other business. All right. Um, Heritage and Tourism, Ms. Kane. I have a bunch of things. Um, first of all, um, scarecrows, and this dovetails with what Paul just said. There are huge crowds along Main Street, lots of strollers, lots of dog walking. Um, and the, there are 58 scarecrows this year. So that's up and... Um, it's, it, that's a big thing to draw for Connecticut, for Weathersfield. Um, the photo contest uh, entries have to be in by October 26th, if anybody has pictures on your camera. Um, tourism was asked if they wanted, and I guess it was with EDIC as well, uh, to have NBC was uh, willing to do a video and uh, uh, show it on their network, but um, it was very costly. So um, Heritage uh, Tourism decided to pass on it. So that will not happen. However, the History Channel is going to be filming in October in the houses uh, in Old Weathersfield. 
the food that built America. So hopefully that will be um, an interesting, another movie coming from Old Weathersfield. Um, the stakeholders meeting is uh, the ninth tomorrow. And uh, there will be a uh, doors, door decorating. Uh, shopkeepers have not come up with a holidays on Main alternative yet, but they're talking about it. And I think there's new leadership in the uh, sh shopkeepers and I think they're excited. Yes, actually, if I can piggyback off of that, Judy, I was at their meeting just the other day. Um, Dr. Joe Pascali, the Pascal, from Bill yeah. Tactic, uh, is the new head of it. And, you know, he's got a ball of enthusiasm. And, uh, um, yeah, there's talk of, obviously, the Scarecrows on Main right now. They are trying to come up with a, um, a format similar to what you guys are doing with uh, Salute to Business for the award recipients uh, of uh, the top three Scarecrows that they do. Uh, looking at Webb Barn, looking at possibly the parking lot of the Keeney Center, looking at the parking lot of the uh, Larissa Lake um, hair salon. So there's a, a number of ideas that they're they're trying to come up with. Nothing has been firmed up uh, just yet. I'll be happy to, you know, kind of act as a liaison, Peter, if you want to coordinate any what those guys are doing and, and know what they're doing. Yeah, um, they, they asked me to attend their meeting next week on the yep. 13th, so I'll, I'll be there. Good. Yep. Um, and then the only other thing, and I think it kind of got squashed, was the idea of doing a, if they can't do a holidays on Maine, that they would um, possibly do a um, snowman figure coming out of the pots for the uh, beautification. But um, I think most of the people said that uh, strolling down Main Street in December is a lot different than strolling down Main Street in the middle of October. So. Um, and you don't want to kind of diminish the value of the scarecrows on Maine um, with doing that. So, but um, Dr. Joe is, uh, he's full of ideas and um, he's looking to, uh, to keep that momentum going that Judy mentioned along, uh, along Main Street. Also, uh, it was brought up that there are five new businesses just in uh, the shopkeepers. Um, so that's great. I'm Judy and Mayor. Um, if you'd like to have Dr. Joe or anybody from the shopkeepers um, attend an EDIC meeting, virtual EDIC meeting, to discuss what they're doing, and, and a lot of times those conversations spark um, ingenuity, um, mm -hmm. we'd be more than happy to have them involved and give them uh, you know, a five-minute, ten-minute um, presentation if they would like to share anything with EDIC RDA. Well, Great. at the meeting tomorrow, maybe I can bring that up to um, Dr. Joe and see if he's interested. Great. Does that conclude your report, Judy? That's, I'm done. Thank you. Um, Chamber of Commerce, Deb? So some of the things I've already gone over, but um, I, I did want to reiterate what everybody else is saying. And I had mentioned it to you the other night, Mark, when we, when we spoke about the positive influence that's going around in town right now. I mean, our, our town is really buzzing with that. And yeah, I'm, I, I'm hearing that all the time. So we attended the webinar or the uh, meeting for the businesses the other morning at 10 o'clock on Tuesday. And I did get some, I got some great re, uh, feedback from that from some of the business owners. Um, several of them said they wanted to know if we could have better lead time when when we post the, have those meetings, um, that their schedules are pretty full and if we could plan them more ahead of time, just an FYI. Uh, and also several of the uh, uh, business owners wanted to know that even when we are blessed enough to get rid of this COVID and all the phases of reopening, if we could continue having maybe quarterly meetings with the town and the business owners. Um, I think that's a great idea. I'm wondering if the 10 o'clock time is not good for some of the owners. Cause when I reached out to some of them afterwards saying, Hey, you know, you weren't at the meeting, but I'm going to pass on the link or let you know, they, they, they mentioned the timing was not great for them. 
So, um, and I should know this, but I don't. Is that uh, link already posted on the town site for the, for the meeting that I can pass on to them? Does anybody know that? The video, uh, yes, it's, it's on the YouTube there... uh, channel and on the town website. Great, thanks, Peter. Um, so that's what I have on that. They loved it. Um, I had, was lucky enough to be on a Zoom call with Peter and Gary the other day with three of the um, learning centers in town who seemed to be really concerned about their businesses and struggling with, you know, staying open because of COVID and a lot of the uh, families not being able to uh, up forward to bring their children there. But what I did get out of that meeting was that they seemed to, because I followed up with them afterwards, three of the learning centers, they just felt better having us there and kind of holding their hands. So I, I, I think that's important in, in town and I think we're all doing a great job with that. I am, um, I've spoken to the new leadership at the Shopkeepers Association. I couldn't agree with you more. He is awesome. He is enthusiastic. He's energetic. Um, I love it. I'm, I'm bored with him and I'm going to be at that meeting on Tuesday. I'd like to see the chamber working more in conjunction with the shopkeepers and helping each other with that. So I'm really excited about, about that. Um, I've been putting on our, our e-blast when somebody needs help on employment. So just an FYI, I happened to catch the town clerk's uh, opening a while back and I posted that. So if anybody knows of anybody that needs help, wants their employment ad you know, on there, let me know about that. Seems to uh, help some about of the four positions I'll send your way. You can post out. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I'm happy to do that. Um, let's see. We already mentioned the welcome bags are not getting a great response from my end of it. I think Marco makes some great points that people are not wanting to touch and they're, you know, getting away from that and a lot of digital things. Uh, I think we should be gearing towards on that too. So. Um, I'm happy to help with that if I can. Let's see, uh, the state of the town breakfast we talked about. I guess I had the wrong date, but I will get back to you on that. Um, Keeney Center did save that date for us, so I'll let you know there. Um, and as we all know, uh, this week I officially told the town holiday on Main uh, is, is being canceled. But um, I wanna say, I hear every time somebody, uh, an organization such as the chamber or the town or whatever, labors about canceling these events, um, I think we struggle more with that than the people receiving the news because I got so many, several uh, calls and emails from people actually thanking the chamber for canceling the holiday on Maine and saying what a, a tough decision that was. So. I think we struggle more than, than the people receiving the news. I think they appreciate the, um, uh, of being, us being protective of the community. So I just wanted to send that out to you as well. Um, I think that's all we have, except the chamber is uh, gearing towards, because our fundraiser events have been null and void this year, we're gearing towards more um, getting the, the, the businesses together and, um, Networking, we're holding networking meetings now twice a month and the first one's starting next week. I'll send that out. So, uh, you know, like all of us, seeing a face with a name is just so much more important than just a name. So we're, we're looking to like even meld our professional loyalties together even more so. So um, that's what we're working on. Great, thank you, Deb. Um, just to uh, piggyback on that one thing on the quarterly meetings, Peter and I have talked about, um, you know, out of uh, the ashes comes a phoenix once in a while. And I think this is one of those examples that I think those meetings just make a lot of sense. Having everybody, you know, from the fire department to uh, building, um, everybody on a, a call is just a great idea. And I think that's something that we're definitely willing to participate on you know, on a quarterly basis, I've obviously scheduling wise and whatnot, I'd have to talk with Gary and Pete to make sure that fits within the profile of everybody's time. Uh, but I agree, I think the more they get promoted um, in, in the, uh, 
the better it is just to the community. It's a no brainer to me. So I'm glad to hear that they, the response was good on the quarterly meetings. Um, yeah, I have nothing to report. Especially, Mark, one more thing, especially if we like, if we can get where, you know, it's a given, like every whatever, that's the meeting. I think that would give a be better response as well. Yeah, agreed. Um, we will talk about that um, uh, further for sure. Um, I have nothing to report, um, subcommittee reports. So we need to schedule a marketing meeting, uh, guys, for next week. And uh, um, the end of next week for me, not that I have to be there, but I would like to be there is, is nutty but I can make an early Monday or Tuesday uh, work next week. How does that work for anybody? Um, Mark, but we certainly would like you to be there and Judy for you to be there for sure. Every, everybody's is welcome, but if you could be at that um, Zoom meeting Monday, that would be great, uh, or Tuesday. So I could definitely do um, Monday morning. Um, I could do two. I could do Monday afternoon or Tuesday afternoon, but it would have to probably be like after two thirty one of those days. Uh, but Monday morning would work. Um, I could probably squeeze in a call at nine o'clock on Tuesday morning as well. Pete, do you have? Are we talking this meeting? Monday? Monday's yes. Columbus Day. Oh, Our Columbus Day. Town yes. hall will be closed. Yes. I'm happy to. I'm happy to meet, but I'm not. But Peter can't. Okay. Um, then that moves us to Tuesday. Tuesday morning works for me. Yeah. Marco, uh, I can really we do, can do it earlier. I'm fine with 9 o'clock. I mean, yeah, whatever you want to do. Yep. Whatever works. Are you okay with an 8.30 call, uh, Marco, on, on Tuesday? Yeah, that's fine. Yep, that works. All right. So it's Tuesday the 13th at 8.30. Pete, you'll send an invite out to the group? I will. Yep. Thank you, sir. And um, we need to get a copy of the letter that we drafted. That's a big part of the meeting. Yeah, um, and obviously we'll talk about the other items that we um, suggest, including the salute to business. Um, uh, you guys, we have the minutes. Pete, I know minutes from some of the older meetings are in here as well. Did we not vote on the or approve those? Is that why they're in here? They were not uh, typed up until now. So, okay, the town manager cut my budget for for someone to do the minutes, just for the record. So I do these myself. All right, well, you've done a fine job. I, I need to uh, share that with you. Well, we have uh, several minutes to approve. Um, if you guys would like to take a minute and uh, just take a look at them, um, we do would like to get a minute to approve the minutes that Peter has done such a nice job on. Mr. Carson, I know you've done your due diligence on these already. I'll make a motion to approve when everybody's ready. I'll second it. Great. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Great. Thank you for that. Um, our next meeting is scheduled Thursday, November 12th. Um, and again, our meeting will be next week. Marketing meeting will be Tuesday, 8.30, uh, Tuesday the 13th at 8.30. Peter, we had correspondence um, that I wanted to refer to. You had uh, correspondence from Cindy, is that correct? Which I know yes. I, okay. Um, we got a, um, and Cindy, I know you're on the call. Um, Cindy has done um, some, um, some yeoman's work, if you will, on kind of evaluating um, uh, where, we're, where, we are, where, where we are at, uh, where the EDIC slash RDA could go. Um, I've asked, I read them um, uh, very specifically. There's some interesting stuff there. Um, and I'd like for Peter to forward uh, a copy of uh, Cindy's uh, correspondence to us, to all members of the commission. Um, and we can put those as a uh, agenda item, uh, uh, if not the coming meeting, the meeting after. Um, but um, pl please pass on those notes 
Peter, to Cindy, to all members of the commission. Uh, and Cindy, thank you for your work on that. Um, that concludes our meeting. Um, I appreciate everybody's time uh, today. Stay healthy, stay safe, um, and may have a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. Thank you, Mr. Pace. All those in favor, turn your computers off. <laughs> Thanks, Aye. everyone. Have a great day. Oh, okay. All right.